Good evening and welcome to the March 28th meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to start out the meeting by taking a roll call. If we'd start at our right, please, and uh, introduce yourself as a roll call. Peter Black. Jim Walsh. Len Stolino. Jay Chatmus. Michael Trentfalia. Gib Mendelson. I'd like to uh, welcome our newest member of the, the board, Peter Black. Welcome and thank you for for joining us. There's going to be a little bit of a, a change in the uh, agenda this evening. Uh, once a year, the rules and regulations of the uh, uh, zoning board uh, require that we vote for officers once a year. Uh, that typically takes place in the December meeting, at the end of the December meeting or the beginning of the January or the next meeting. Um, oftentimes, we don't have a December meeting because of Christmas holidays. There's a slowdown in, in uh, applications during the winter months. Um, this is our first meeting since our last November meeting. Um, and so the first item that I need to deal with as chairman is to uh, hold elections. The rules and regulations uh, state that officers, of which there are two, there's a chairman and secretary, are elected for, two, for a one-year term and to be re-elected or uh, hold elections once a year at the end of each year. I have been chairman for two years and uh, actually two and a half years I assumed uh, uh, the chairmanship was voted as chairman uh, when David Backer was elected to uh, town council and then I was subsequently elected to two one-year terms. So I have reached my term limit. Um, and also, we need to elect a new, uh, not only a new chairman, but a new secretary uh, at, at this time. Uh, I'd like to start out with uh, uh, nominations for chairman. I'd like to move the nomination of Len Galino as chair of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. I second that a motion. Second that motion. May we have a vote, please? We have a nomination of Len Galino for chairman. All those in favor? All in favor? Uh, congratulations. Uh, next is the uh, uh, vote for secretary. May I have a motion for that? I'd like to uh, uh, nominate Mon Michael Tranfalia, please, for secretary. I'll second that nomination. Any comments? Do you accept the nomination? I do. Okay. All those in favor? All in favor. Good. Uh, there's now a change in chairmanship. Uh, I would like to make a couple of comments first, if, if, uh, departing comments, if I may. But I'll keep these very brief. Uh, I've been chairman for two and a half years, and I've been on the board for uh, in more than five years, and I, I, I want to thank the current board members that we uh, have and the two that are not here tonight who have reached their term limit, or not reached their term limit, have elected not to uh, 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 apply for new membership, and that's Steve LaPlante and Joe Guglielmetti. Uh, in the last several years, I think our board has been uh, board membership has been very uh, 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 consistent and very professional in, in many ways. I don't think the board, our board, has done anything special, and I, I want to make that point clear. But what is remarkable or notable is that the board members, each of the board members, and I've had the opportunity to serve with a number of these for uh, several of these for a number of years, is that each board member takes the time to listen to the case and, and understand the case and listen to the applicant. And I think that's, I think that's uh, very beneficial for the, for the town and the applicants. Um, I've, have, I've sat on boards before and been uh, made presentations before, before other boards before. And it's been apparent to me that a lot of the decisions or some of the decisions have been made I don't know, it, it seems like more from a position of power than a, than a position of, of uh, understanding. And, and I think what is remarkable or notable is that the board members that we have had, including the two that are not 
uh, were not uh, reappointed is that uh, the, the board members take time to understand the case, to listen to the audience, and listen to the, the comments. And I, I think that's notable. Um, and I want to thank each of you for your support. I'd like to thank Bruce Smith for his support as a code enforcement officer. I think uh, Bruce is extremely knowledgeable on, on code laws and, and ordinances, and that's exhibited by his position on the state level. And Lori, for her wonderful uh, recording secretary uh, abilities, I think she does an outstanding job. And lastly, I'd like to thank Ryan Cook, who is our unsung hero, our media specialist. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I think there's a significant audience for this presentation. I don't know how we ever compete with CSI or <laughs> TV shows like that, but but there's a, uh, the, believe it or not, there's a, uh, I have talked to enough people that I think there's a significant audience who do tune in to our meeting and planning board and town council meetings at home. And so we'd like to thank Ryan Cook, who, our unsung hero, who makes all this possible with lighting and cameras and, and microphones. With that brief statement, thank you. And I'll turn the chairman over uh, to Lynn Galeno. If uh, I could ask your indulgence for a minute. I've been on lots of boards um, in my career, and I want to thank you for your, um, your leadership and your willingness to steer the ship, because I think a lot of what you just stated is really about you in many ways, listening to the applicant and, uh, and doing the homework and asking the right questions and encouraging us to participate. And um, I think as a citizen in Cape Elizabeth and a member of this board, I think we've been uh, fortunate to have you lead us for the last two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is my first uh, act as uh, chair. I want to thank Dr. Chapman not only for hand handing me the gavel, but just to follow up on Jim's comments just briefly for the wonderful leadership. And I do think it's a reflection of the uh, preparedness that you always come to these meetings with that has rubbed off on the rest of us. And I think we've uh, realized that you have to um, come to these meetings prepared, and you've always done that. And so I thank you for teaching me the sort of the ropes and watching you the last couple of years, and hopefully I won't flub it too badly tonight. So if we could just have a quick moment. All right, um, on to business. Um, I guess the first item on business, we've already had the introductions, so the next issue would be to review the minutes from the last meeting, which were, was in our packet. And that would be of the November 22nd, 2005 meeting. Um, do we have any comments or discussions on the minutes? Any proposed changes? I, I have a couple of very minor on page two, line 40. Uh, the word he should be his. Uh, page three, line two. Uh, also the same, he should be here. I, I'm not sure the correct wording of, of line two on that. Yes, I believe it's appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, his view, it looks like. Any, do you have that, Lori? Okay. Yeah. Further comments? Could I have a motion to approve the minutes as modified? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Minutes are approved. Um, next, any, I don't believe there's any other old business to address tonight. New business, I believe we have one item on the agenda, and that is the application sub submitted by Christopher Supple, is that how it's pronounced, Supple, 
uh, for variance for back property line for 6 Westfield Road, lot 2-9, map U42, uh, submitted by Mr. Supple on March 14, 2006. Well, would the applicant please come to the podium and present the case? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity this evening. Um, as many of you might have gotten from the initial description in the application that we provided almost a year ago, uh, we recognized a couple of things about our current property. We've been in the property almost three years now. Uh, okay, if you could just, and that was my mistake go. by not asking you, could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Christopher Supple, resident of 6 Westfield Road. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we recognized it, uh, this last year that our existing deck, which is a fairly large structure on the back of our house, was not only getting unsafe, but was also somewhat out of code. So we had begun planning to do things to get to replace that deck at a minimum. And in that planning process, uh, we also recognized that our family had grown since we moved into the house. And with that growth, <clears throat> we were starting to experience some space issues within the house, mostly in regards to accessible storage. Uh, so we started to um, organize our thoughts about what we might do to uh, not only replace the deck, but to potentially improve that situation. Um, versus, you know, down the road as, as the family grew, got larger, that maybe having to consider moving down the road or whatever. And we started to develop ideas about uh, extent, making an addition on the back of the house that would kind of work in conjunction with a new deck uh, to help alleviate some of the space issues we have and to, uh, to uh, also replace that deck. In the course of, of that planning, uh, our initial thought um, prior to getting any significant data regarding our, our boundary lines, because prior to, prior to us uh, pursuing this project, our boundary lines were not clearly marked uh, in our property or throughout the neighborhood for that matter. Uh, markings had obviously been torn out over the years. Um, we uh, had originally thought about doing a separate room of a larger scale and a deck off of that. Fortunately, I have some good friends where I work who happen to be in the property area, and uh, they convinced me that it would be a good idea to get a survey done. So we were able to link up with the uh, person who had done the original work on the, on the mortgage statement for the house, and he did a, he did a full survey of our property. And uh, he... Uh, we obviously, when we, we had that survey done, we found out where the boundary li lines really were versus what most people kind of took as what they thought were the boundary lines based on fences and trees and that sort of thing. And, and what we discovered was that, um, as you can see by the page uh, that shows the survey, is that uh, the lines and in in the situation, how our house is situated on that lot, um, it, it's fairly tight. We did recognize quickly based on that survey and, and on the tax form information that I've been able to get from the Code Enforcement Office that we do have the smallest lot within that neighborhood. And also the, the way that lot is designed, we actually came to realize that actually some of the existing corners of our, our base dwelling are probably, if not already, outside of the setback requirements of 20 feet. So <clears throat> based on that information, we realized that some, in, in some respect uh, we wanted to try to pursue some form of the same project, but realized we needed to scale it back a little bit. We started to evaluate what we truly needed from a space perspective um, and tried to focus in on that to, to come to what we, we felt is our final of our best plan for this particular project. And at that point, I started to work with the Code Enforcement Office to get a little bit better educated on, on the zoning ordinance and what kind of setbacks are required, uh, what kind of structures have to fall into those setbacks. And, and, and Bruce and his office have been very helpful in, in, in helping me get questions answered and, and get clarification. So what we did after a bit of planning is uh, we came up with the solution or the proposal for an addition that's shown a few pages before that is essentially a 12 by 10 room um, where on the main level, which is the upstairs level, would basically be an addition to our dining room. It would basically push that wall out 10 feet and be 12 feet wide. The downstairs portion of it actually would be a, a separate, a, a foundation only, um, and would be accessible from our family room uh, by the door shown. Uh, that, that, with the purpose of that room being nothing but a simple cement foundation area. It's not going to be heated in any way. There's not going to be any plumbing in it. Uh, we're looking to run a little bit of electricity for light in a potential uh, larger freezer. What our intent here is for that particular area, and that's why I kind of uh, 
space plant it for you in this particular thing is to show what uh, our current storage capacity is relatively inaccessible to some extent. Um, I mean, we can get to things, but not easily. We have, uh, we do a lot of storage with totes and, and that sort of thing of seasonal clothes, camping gear, holiday things, uh, and uh, various other things. And they're in attics and they're under stairs and, and, and we've gotten to a situation where our garage has obviously absorbed a lot of that as well. So our, we're starting to, to find that our point of, we're at a point now where the garage is becoming less and less useful as a garage. And uh, we're having a, a bit of, a lot of difficulty now kind of getting to things and getting at things. So we found that one of the major benefits of this plan um, for us, from our perspective, would be to, uh, to utilize that downstairs space for more accessible storage, uh, where we can get to these things a little easier, have ability to access them. And, uh, and as well, uh, we do a fair amount of bulk shopping at BJ's, and one area we haven't utilized a great deal has been like in meat and produce, in which case we want to try to find a place to put a, a freezer for that purpose, and we found this might be a, a worthwhile location to do it. Uh, addition, in addition to that room, or that expansion of that room, we also have a, a deck proposed, which is uh, smaller than the original deck, um, but um, ends up being about 12 by 16. The result was, from uh, after we had shaved it down to what we thought was the most reasonable thing we could could do to be the most uh, useful to us was we came with this 12 by 10 structure which would require a setback at one corner of about four feet, slightly less, um, about three foot eight we think. But you mean a reduction by four feet? Correct, yeah. We'd, uh, it, with that corner, uh, if this were built, that corner would be about 16 feet from the back property line when it was all said and done. And then by, based on the orientation of the house, that becomes a little less as you go further on, and then the deck happens to be uh, within setback guidelines based on its function because of the 15-foot setback rule for the deck. So it's the, uh, the basic one corner of the house of the, uh, the proposed addition, which equals about 36 square feet, um, is what is requiring this, what would require this variance to be able to accomplish it. Um, so we, uh, for that reason, once we had, uh, you know, justified to ourselves that we had uh, really reduced it to a level that we thought was useful to us. We decided to proceed with this process to see if we could, you know, uh, go through the uh, process of getting a variance accepted for, the, for us to proceed forward. We have looked at other sides of the house um, to do something similar. And again, as we refer back to the survey, there's very limited, if any, opportunity to do anything on any of the corners uh, outside of the one we're discussing. Uh, that would make a whole lot of sense as far as useful, use, useful space in relation to the rest of the house, uh, I think is really what it comes down to. We, um, we in going through the application, you know, we uh, looked at addressing some of the concerns that are in the application in regard to uh, if there'd be any negative impact on the environment. In this case, uh, there, there isn't. There, we're, we're basically replacing a structure that already existed. The old structure just happened to be a deck that didn't require the variance. There's, uh, I don't see actually there's going to be a need to do anything more than dig up some dirt. There's no, actually not even any grass there at the moment. And, but there'll be no trees or anything of that nature, think anything affected in that nature. Um, we also have uh, developed this plan in that very uh, similarly to a, to a couple of the comparables that I note with pictures later on in the document that show some additions that were put on these houses later, it, earlier on. Uh, it's going to be very similar in nature, in appearance, to uh, the structure shown for lot 2-10 on 4 Westfield Road and lots 2-6. The, uh, the deck, our proposed deck will be a little larger, but the room itself is going to very much be in the same character as those types of additions. We are going to use uh, similar finishes that are the rest of our house has with cedar shingles, white trim, shingle roof, um, and, uh, and, and, and <coughs> basically keep it in line with the rest of the neighborhood to keep the character of the neighborhood. Um, we also uh, looked at whether or not, uh, tried to analyze whether we fit within the rest of the guidelines regarding the ordinance. Uh, Bruce had quoted me that it's, uh, you can't uh, cover more than 25% of your property with a footprint in the calculation of this proposal. Uh, it puts us a little bit around 17.6%, so we still fall well under uh, that particular guideline, uh, which we uh, 
I figured we would. The also asked, um, as far as the other issues were concerned, did, did previous owners work cause the situation or anything like that? And we're not aware that it did. This is the, uh, the original structure um, that, that, that we're, being, we're encountering with. One thing we did learn uh, through the survey process was that our surveyor uh, had a significantly difficult time with this particular survey, not only from the standpoint that the markings, he didn't have any markings really to work from, but in the way he described it to me was that he, uh, he, was, he was using an existing town plan and he, he found some discrepancy in the plan so that when he was trying to match, survey it and plot it out, it wasn't really matching up with what existed on the town plan. And the best he could assume is that when it was done, um, a change in pro and method had been used somewhere in the process and had kind of skewed some lines here and there. So he was, uh, he was a little bit surprised at the outcome as well. But, um, you know, it is what it is, and we've had to basically accept that. It's, a, it's quite an eye-opener when you kind of see where, you're, where, you, where you, uh, you really live. I, uh, I got a joke with a couple of neighbors that I was going to have to build them for a lot of lawn mowing that I've been doing for them for a while. Um, but, it, but we did proceed forward. I did attempt, uh, based on Bruce's recommendation, to go out and get some comparables to see what else existed within the, the surrounding neighborhood. I did put together a spreadsheet that kind of showed some data. Um, from, that, from those findings, and basically keyed on the four properties within our neighborhood um, that have additions on them. Uh, the closest one, or the, the one that came closest on its back property line was lot 2-1. Uh, in, in conversation with the owner of that property, they put on a garage, which is approximately 616 square feet. And he, he indicates, although it was not clearly visible due to a lack of markings, but he indicates they're about a foot from their setback requirement, about 21 feet from their back property line. That was probably the closest situation in regard to a back property line. The other additions we found had a lot of space in the back, although we did recently learn this past weekend that lot 2-10, which is uh, adjacent to our lot, um, the addition pictured there uh, I believe was, that addition was done in the 1980s, although I'm not certain, but at a, at a social gathering of our neighbors this weekend, we learned from them that they actually had to apply for a variance for that particular addition on their side setback requirement. And uh, although I don't have the exact details of it, a quick measurement indicates that they probably have a variance of about three feet or so. The, the nearest point to the boundary line of that particular structure is about 17 feet. So we do find some history of, of some comparable types of projects taking place in the uh, immediate neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we feel uh, strongly that our, the scope of our project fits right in line with the scope of some of these other projects that have been done through the history of the neighborhood. And so we, we're proposed, our proposal comes to you with that thought in mind that we're, we, uh, you know, our intent is to produce some, uh, some, some very useful storage space and a little bit of additional livel, livable space for a, for a family that has grown a bit since it got into that house. And, uh, and also provide some significantly useful storage space for us, as well as replace this deck that was, that was in bad condition to begin with. Um, let's see if I have any other points. The other thing that I wanted to mention that I, I just got, I guess I found kind of ironic, and that was something I passed by Bruce a, a week or so ago, was a, a particular section in the zoning ordinance on page 60 that uh, talks about accessory structures. I, I questioned Bruce as to what is an accessory structure. And on section 19-6-1, it talks about, uh, uh, part seven, it talks about an accessory structure having a, up to 150 square feet, uh, having a 15 foot setback requirement. So I, I asked Bruce what, you know, what qualifies as an accessory structure. Maybe we did or whatever. Certainly we don't in this case, and he basically described it as a separate entity that, that, you know, uh, maybe like a storage shed or something of that nature. And I just said to him in, in, in remark that it's kind of ironic that I could potentially sit a 30 square foot larger building on this same exact spot and not need a variance at all, you know, and just, uh, so I just, I just point that out as it's, it, the impact on neighboring properties would in, in effect be very little compared to maybe something I could do, which I'm not out here threatening or anything. I'm not going to put a 150 square foot shed on my backyard, but um, just, just a point to keep in mind that I, we feel we've done uh, our best to minimize the size of the project, but, but maximize uh, our benefit from it. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions or concerns you might have.
Um, Mr. Supple, first I just wanted to um, thank you for the professional um, presentation of your materials. It was uh, very orderly and easy to follow. Uh, we appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that you went through the expense of having a survey, which was certainly helpful. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask was, did that letter go to the neighbors? Oh, yes, it did. Um, we, we distributed that letter. Let me see if I can. On March 4th, uh, basically sent it around and put it on all their mailboxes. Yeah. In that letter, as you saw, uh, we've asked for any feedback people might have. Uh, the weekend, I think it was a week later that I did the measuring. Uh, of those, particularly those four properties, and I reached out and contacted them by phone before I went sneaking around their yards, and and uh, you know had a conversation with the uh, the owner of uh, lot two one, the one with the garage, and right. that's where I found out about his setback and how close he was. And we we've received uh, we've received no negative feedback right. um, from that letter, as a, and and in and in it, actually we've we've received a lot of very positive support. Right. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, we were at a social function this past weekend where we found out about that other setback issue uh, for, the, for our immediate neighbors, and, and there was a number of people there, and you know, every one of them wished us well, and, and you know, is there anything we can do, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had good response from it right. um, to include the neighbors to our immediate back. Who, uh, well, I, I appreciate the fact that you sent that letter out, and it's just a personal opinion, not in the ordinance, but uh, my own personal view on it is that um, this is the state where life should, the way life should be, and that certainly goes along with following that motto of talking to your neighbors ahead of these applications, uh, especially for any viewing audience out there, so that a lot of these issues can sometimes be worked out ahead of time. And it's certainly uh, in the interest of uh, neighborliness that people communicate and talk about what they intend to do openly and accurately. And it seemed like your letter, I, I, I commend you on being detailed with your letter and ex describing exactly what you wanted to do. So thank you for doing thank that. Thank you. We actually, um, one of the attributes of the neighborhood that we've liked, enjoyed so much is there is a very, uh, very significant amount of open communication amongst neighbors. It's a very, uh, very friendly place to be. And uh, we've, we've been there uh, almost three years now, as I mentioned, and we have two small children, and, and it's a very nice place to, to raise them because there is such a friendly, open nature about, about that area, which is, is very nice to live in, there's no right. doubt. Yeah. One question on the survey, you indicated, um, and maybe you don't know exactly, but how, what was the discrepancy between the old survey and the new survey? Well, you, you know. Don't, you don't know? Not specifically, and, and, I, and I wish I had a little bit better grasp on the terms he used at the time, but uh, he had a plot of the, which was basically the whole neighborhood, dated sometime around 1961, I believe, that he had apparently come, used from the town, and, and he just stated he was having a difficult time finding points to go from and having them match up with the points that were on that and, and, and with the coordinates he was taking and that sort of thing. And he said the only thing he can measure, he, he described to me that there were basically three methods of surveying and I can't honestly say which they were, but he seems to think that somewhere in the process of doing that original 1961 survey, maybe methods had changed and that would have thrown off some lines. And he said, he said it would probably surprise a lot of people in the neighborhood where their lines really were. It's interesting, the people next to us, the ones with the, with the uh, lot 2-4 that have the, the, uh, the side setback variants, their fence runs, uh, we always took their fence that separates the two yards as the property line, you know, basically. In fact, he helped me, uh, he helped me install a swing set, you know, right on the other side of that fence. It turns out his fence could actually come about, one end of it could come about eight feet into our property based on the real survey. So it's very evident that there's a bit of, Un unawareness of where people's mm -hmm. property lines really are and, 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 and probably attributed to the potential discrepancy that might have existed in that original survey. Yeah. Many sure. of our neighbors, uh, that two da lot 2-4, uh, uh, lot 2-5, no, excuse me. Uh, yes, 2-5 and actually lot 2-10 and a couple others of people who have been there for quite a number of years. In fact, lot 2-5, I think, have, have lived in that neighborhood since, since it was built. So there's, there was, she had her lot surveyed shortly after ours. Right. Yeah. Mr. Walsh, do yeah. you have a question? Uh, Mr. Supple, following along on that same, uh, yeah. with the survey and mm -hmm. some of the discrepancies or inaccuracies or whatever you found, 
you've um, stated some estimates in terms of measurements on your spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the methodology that you use to determine those estimates? Sure. Given the un sort of uh, unknowns that were brought sure. to that survey Absolutely. system? Sure, absolutely. What, what I basically did is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, with our survey completed and with the survey of lot 2-5 completed, it gave me a little data to use in trying to, in trying to shoot some measurements out from some of these structures that existed. And what I basically looked for was I took 20 feet initially, and, if, and then if they went beyond that significantly, I'd, I'd continue to stretch it to where I took a best guess looking at, well, I see my marker over there, and, and, and kind of did my best guess. And that's kind of why I, why I, I, I give it an estimate. Um, in most of those cases, with the exception of that one, the, uh, the space is considerably significant, so there wasn't much question that they didn't have any issue with a, a variance or anything like that, particularly with, with lot 2-5. But that's how I, I, I basically came to that. I used the, the boundary lines that were created from those two surveys that were done to, to do a best estimate. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Maybe you can help us a little bit in looking at your spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand the right-hand column, that gives us the closest distance to the rear boundary of those various houses. Right. So basically, if I understand your chart, um, all those houses um, basically have their um, back piece of their house, including any additions that have been put on, uh, greater than the 20-foot setback requirement, right? Yeah, it does appear that way, absolutely, yeah. The, uh, the, the only ones in the neighborhood that do have any sort of addition structures are the ones that I noted in the con in the, with the photos in the back. Yeah. Uh, and even in those cases, uh, there's, there's not much issue because of the, the, the depth of their lots. Right, right. I assume you're probably familiar by now with the uh, zoning ordinance, and there's two provisions which um, basically require us to look at the abutters, and that's, of course, why you gave us this chart right, right. to get the average uh, in the neighborhood mm -hmm. of the 10 closest um, property owners. Yeah. And basically, um, we have to establish, in order to grant the variance, that there would be a significant economic injury. Mm -hmm. And that basically is defined such that by failing to grant the variance, we would put you uh, at a disadvantage in relation to the average of your 10 abutting neighbors. And um, your chart seems to say to me, and this is, what, this is why I'm asking the question, your chart seems to say to me that that's not the case. In other words, that all your neighbors are in compliance, so um, there doesn't seem to be significant economic injury by virtue of imposing the, uh, the setback requirement on your property in relation to the average. Am I missing something? Uh, no, I think based on the, on the rear setback requirement, you're, you're reading that absolutely correct, and that's exactly what we did find. Um, the, the, um, the, only, the only comparable I could really quote at this time that would help our case, other than that, that 21 foot, which is fairly close, would be the side setback variance for the, for the neighbor to the, to the immediate and that's left, that which one I hadn't quoted in the spreadsheet because it be, became recent. And that's that one neighbor? Correct. So even with the one, of course, that's not the average. Right. No, the, we, uh, we have, I think, quoted 10 properties. And out of those 10, there's four that even have additions on them to begin with, other than sheds. And I didn't go into great detail about sheds. Sheds uh, have a, uh, certainly less of a requirement. There's right. um, three or four sheds that exist right. in those lots that uh, you know, are fairly close to the boundary lines, but that's well within their, with the, within their right. right. But out of those 10, we had four that even had structures that were, quote, additions, and uh, very few of those had, a, had an issue other than the ones just mentioned. Right. Yeah. So, and so then, then the same issue applies with respect to undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Um, you're, you're basically, it sounds like you're conceding the fact that um, that particular test would not be met. At least as to the average in the neighborhood? As to the average, yeah. I, I, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily prove that we're, doing, that, that, we're, that we're doing something in line with the rest of the neighborhood on average, no. Mm -hmm. I think what we're basing our justification on more is that we're not really doing something too far out of the line of average from, a, from an aspect of the scope of the project and how it's going to affect 
neighboring boundaries. Right, and also That's aesthetics kind of, and exactly, yeah, and the effect of the habitat and, and those and those uh, factors. Right. Yes. Just a point of correction: it's not the average; it's the majority being as close or closer. Majority. So it's not the average. Okay. Just, just a slight difference right. there, isn't mm -hmm. there? Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, further questions? Uh, another point along that line on your boundary survey. Uh, yes. It's indicated uh, 20 foot wide drainage easement, and, and it references note number two, which is that easement is, is currently owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Have, have you discussed with them, or have you investigated building in, making further improvements in? A, a, a drainage easement. Actually, no, we have not. Um, the, the only the, the only um, work we did on that, we weren't really aware that that even existed um, at the outset. And our neighbor uh, next door to us, he said, you know, uh, uh, when he when we were talking about the the potential plan prior to the survey, and we were talking about the the foundation work, and he said, you know, there is a some time ago the they came in here and put a big pipe in the ground, and so we 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 did ask the town to come out and they placed some flags to where that pipe ran which runs pretty much uh, just around our boundary line or a little bit beyond it. And we haven't gone forward any further discussing what implications that may have at this time. Further questions? Mr. Supple, I guess the, um, and maybe you can help us here, I, I'm having difficulty with the, um, the significant economic injury aspect of the request for the variance, and I just don't see anything in your application that would um, justify us uh, making a finding that you've um, met that standard as well as the, um, the undesirable, uh, meeting the, uh, that it does not cause an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. So, do you have anything else you want us to consider on those particular issues? Well, as far as the significant economic injury is concerned, um, we're, 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 committed, we're committed to feeling that our feeling is correct in that in doing this project, we are certainly not putting our, our property out of any sort of variance with any of the existing properties, and in some cases, we are bringing them up to a similar capacity from a, from a, from a square footage situation as, as, as some of the other ones are in the neighborhood, but mostly the ones that I've quoted. Um, so if you look at that from a, from a value of the property standpoint, where, where this project is going to bring our house more in line with three or four other properties that have done similar projects uh, in the past, if we don't do the project, obviously it won't. Um, as far as the... Um, <coughs> On top of that is our consideration of whether or not that particular property not being able to do this particular project is going to be useful to us down the road. And, and as, I, as I, you know, quote in the, in, the, uh, in the introduction, we'll have to give serious consideration to moving elsewhere to something larger. And, and, and in this real estate climate, we obviously probably might have to look outside the town of Cape Elizabeth for obvious reasons because the real estate market obviously is very is very substantial here. So those are considerations. It's not, not moves we want to make, wouldn't favor us from a number of standpoints, but that's kind of where we characterize our economic injury, so to speak. As far as the aspect of uh, uh, the, uh, the appearance and the natural habitat and, and being, in, being conforming with kind of the rest of the character of the neighborhood, I, I think we've described uh, significantly that you know, what we're proposing here is going to remain well within um, that, that same character. Something was quoted in the application, I think, at some point about would this, would this uh, proposed structure cause any sort of shadow or anything on a neighboring property and, and, and its particular location where the property lines are, that's, that's not going to be the case. Uh, so we don't see it uh, impacting anybody else, else's property from that standpoint. The, um, that corner that requires the variance is actually somewhat less than the corner of the original deck. So we're really receding the, the footprint in that particular corner slightly than what was there before. 
albeit for a different function and a different type of structure. Um, and I appreciate that. And I mean, if I were deciding, if we were deciding this just upon aesthetics or upon character, the, if the standard was, does it conform with the character of the other, does the change conform with the character of the neighborhood and with the other additions I put, put on, you know, it would be an easy call. Uh, our problem here, of course, is that we have to apply the dimensional requirements, and it requires a 20-foot setback. And if you look at the undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood standard, we have to find that it does not cause an undesirable change. And that's a very specific definition, and it says that the variance, um, if granted, would not cause the, um, the subject property to be basically closer to that uh, or encroach more upon that setback than the uh, average of the nearest 10 principal structures. And as far as I can tell from your chart, um, you don't meet that standard. That doesn't, that doesn't seem to be the case. That's true. Yeah. And, and uh, with, you know, with one exception or two exceptions, that, that seems to be certainly not the average. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, Bruce and I discussed that ahead of time, and, and you know, he mentioned that more than once. And m you know, my basic you know, thought was, well, you know, that if there were that many people with that kind of situation, we probably wouldn't have such setback requirements. It would, you know, if it were the right. norm, we, there wouldn't be such a, a process in place to kind of go through right. this and, and examine it. I just explain that to you because yeah. our authority here uh, is basically to apply the standards of right. the ordinance that we're given. We're not really given discretion right. to sort of waive those as we see fit. So I just wanted to make sure you understood yes, sort definitely. of the standards we're applying to make sure you understand where we're coming from on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I also understand, you know, uh, it, it, particularly through my conversations with the code enforcement office, you know, there's certainly a, uh, because I, I encounter it in my own professional job, there's certainly a, a little bit of reluctance to, to open a door, door so to speak, because that can sometimes result in a, in a, in a, in a lot more being asked for. And, and we are well aware of that, absolutely, and, and understand that. Um, the only thing I, w I guess I would, I would refer back to is the, the oddity of the, of the accessory structure that could exist in that same spot, which would encroach on a neighbor even more than than what we're proposing, and, and although it has a, s a separate function, it's still a structure that takes up space. And right. um, you know, I, not that I'm going to go turn around and just do that for the heck of it, but um, you know, that just is kind of an ironic standard that exists in this particular situation. That um, Mr. Supple, like uh, your proposed addition shows a, a, almost a square off the right rear corner of the house, and and I assume that's that represents your motivated desire as the best size and location. Correct. Uh, had, did you attempt to, from looking at mm -hmm. your proposed plans and looking at the survey, uh, did, did you attempt to configure uh, an addition that was more rectangular that would run further from right to left along the rear of the house and, and at the same time respect the 20-foot rear <laughs> setback, which would meet the needs of you and your family and at the same time not encroach upon. I'm, I'm concerned about the easement. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, typically a definition of an easement like that you, you cannot construct within. And, and so nevertheless, uh, to reconfigure that addition to, to respect the rear setbacks, did you look into that? Yes, we did, absolutely. Uh, it's a very good question. We went through a, a number of iterations of this design over the last year, particularly since the survey was done. And, and one of those was to kind of go to the maximum value we could, which is approximately a six-foot depth. And, and what we found with, with that amount of depth in the intended space, particularly for the storage, is that it wasn't really going to be worth much from a storage perspective. We weren't going to be able to make what, our, what we're terming accessible storage and useful storage and be able to fit in there those things that we kind of intend to. Um, and that's how we came to broadening the depth a little bit further. But we definitely did consider that. Um, not necessarily probably making it longer because we'll, with, the, with the deck on the end, we're not, we, we, you know, we're going to go a certain distance of the house. But we have had that in mind. We, we measured that out. We've drawn it out a couple times. And, it just it just it provides a space that's not particularly functional for that for the needs we're, we're considering. Further questions of the applicant, Mr. Supple? Do you have anything else you want to submit today? Um, 
no, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to talk to you with this about tonight. I just uh, would leave you the, with the thoughts that, uh, as we had mentioned before, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the response from, from our immediate neighbors has been very positive, and, and they've, they've all wished us a great deal of support in this. Um, and we, uh, we are, have done our best to minimize the, the, the scope of the project in order to minimize the amount of amount of variance that we're looking for or, or try to eliminate it and, and would hope that uh, the, the board would see, you know, the, the benefits of this particular uh, project would, would, be, uh, would be well within the character of the rest of the neighborhood and uh, allow us to, uh, to, continue to, to continue to exist there comfortably. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, seeing no one else here to present uh, for or against the applicant, I'm going to close the um, public portion of the uh, hearing and we'll proceed to discuss uh, the application. Does anybody have any comments about uh, this particular application they want to share? Well, if, if I may. Um this is somewhat, in, in some instances, this is relatively a, I don't want to say simple, but an, an easy application to review in, in terms of the ordinance. But in terms of decision making, it's a very difficult one for me personally, mainly because I, I see uh, uh, the role of this uh, board to balance the, um, the ordinance of the town and also to try and uh, bend as much as possible in, in uh, behalf of the homeowner. And uh, that sometimes it's hard to do if the homeowner is, um, uh, has somewhat of a contentious uh, plan or if uh, the plan uh, does uh, appear to upset an in interpretation of the, uh, the neighborhood. It's very difficult when the homeowner uh, has a realistic plan that fits in with the rest of the neighborhood and seems to have complete harmony. The problem with this particular application that I see is that there's no way that I can oversee how the ordinance is uh, written in terms of the setback. I, uh, even though I'm trying to find a way to prove a practical difficulty, I don't, I don't see it uh, in the ordinance. And that's what makes this, for me, a very uh, difficult variance because um, my feelings are is I'd like to grant this variance, but I, I don't see it in any legal standing to it. I agree uh, to that to that point. Uh, uh, that, that there are no are, there are no comparable data to support uh, the request. Uh, that coupled with the fact of uh, 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 building a foundation in the easement, I think, is a, a secondary, but also is a concern. But primary, the, the, from a ordinance standpoint, I the, do not see the supporting data. Uh, no matter how uh, desirable it would be. Um, does anyone have any comments? I think both of your comments are going to items 2 and 4A of the chart. Does anyone have any concerns that the applicant has met the Number one, three, four. Well, I guess four is part of four. Five, six, seven, and eight. Anybody want to discuss those? Well, I, I, I'd like Mr. Smith's comment on this, but uh, item one, number one, this is interpreted as a, a substantial departure, this request. I'm sorry, that it is a substantial departure? Would you consider this a departure from the intent of the ordinance? Uh, element number one. Well, I'm not sure that that's for me to decide, but that's for the board to decide. 
Basically, I mean, I think what he's asking for there is um, some help. It, it, it says there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance by this proposed variance, I assume, is what the, the intent is there. Well, I think if you, if you, if you, if, if, if some of the elements aren't met, then, then it certainly could be construed to be a substantial departure. Yeah. I'm not sure that is as crucial as is. Yeah. As well, what I'd like to do is take these, maybe we should go through them one at a time, and why don't we just start with one and, and discuss it, and then we'll vote on whether or not they met that standard. Um, I guess I'm not of the view that just because they might not meet two or four, it means that they necessarily don't meet, the applicant doesn't meet the other provisions. Um, so, I mean, my own view on number one anyway is that <clears throat> it, it basically the, it indicates the intent of the ordinance is to promote land use conformities except that non-conformity conditions that were created by the adoption of this ordinance shall be allowed to continue subject to the requirements of this article. Um, it's sort of a general statement of intent of the ordinance and um, I don't think this particular applicant proposed change is a substantial departure uh, from the intent of the ordinance. Um, that's, of course, reserving the question whether or not they meet, meet the requirements of two or four. Anyone else want to comment further on that? Mr. Smith, you have any further comments on that? No. Okay. Um, could I have a motion with respect to the issue of whether or not the applicant has met requirement number one? Are we voting? Is that? Uh, it would, unless you want to feel there's more discussion necessary on it. Are we in the voting stage? Um, if I was going to propose to, um, if you want to have further discussion, that's fine. I have no further comment. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion requested, I would. Um, Propose that we go through the voting process on each of the uh, elements to consider the um, application for the uh, variance proposed by Mr. Supple. The first question, the first uh, requirement is that there uh, that the variance request must not be a substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. Um, could I have a motion on that particular issue? Well, let me just state it affirmatively. Um, all those finding that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. We are voting. Is that what we're doing? Yes. Okay. So there's no motion. There's a vote. There's a vote. Item number one. Yeah. You're correct. So we will once again try it one more time. Um, the first issue to vote on is, is there a, is the question of it, there is no, does the variance provide no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance? All those finding that the application, the applicant has met that uh, element. Um, unanimous finding that the applicant has met standard number one. Number two, um, a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined and a practical difficulty is defined as an occasion where the strict application of the ordinance to a property precludes the ability of the property owner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in a significant economic injury to the property owner. Significant economic injury is defined as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning, and zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. All those voting in favor of finding that the applicant has met the, st uh, the standard of practical difficulty. All those finding that the applicant has not met that standard. Uh, Five, finding that the applicant has not met the standard, and one finding that 
the applicant has met that standard. The third element is the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general circumstances of the neighborhood. All those finding that the applicant has met that element, unanimous. Number four, the granting of a variance will not produce an undes undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. And determining whether a variance would have an unreasonable detrimental effect on the use or market value of abutting properties, the zoning board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of adjoining property owners by 10% or more, or of eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the loss of privacy. All those voting in favor of finding that the applicant has met that element. All those finding that the applicant has not met that standard, one opposed. Five in favor, one opposed. Uh, may I? Yep. Mr. Chairman, may I stop you right there? Uh, item element number four. Four uh, A. Uh, directly four. addresses uh, the definition that we were discussing uh, of significant ec economic. You're right. I stand corrected. That I, form uh, may it, have to be updated because that doesn't include that in that form you're reading from, does it? It has it under 4A. It's confusing the way it's laid out, and I stand corrected. That undesirable change definition is within 4. So I think we need to take the vote again once I properly read it. So let me start over, and I apologize. Element number 4. Mr. Chairman? Yep. Pardon me. Maybe it would be beneficial to... Uh, the, the audience, if, if uh, the definition of significant economic injury was, was read, and I think that would clarify the, the intent of that vote. Um, I think I did read that for number I two. emphasize that again. That's um, the intent of that vote. That's the substance of, of item number four. Are you just on page two? Uh, I would propose reading 4A, which is the definition of undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, is defined as. Just to clarify, and I mean, Mr. Supple, I apologize, I misread that. Item number four includes within it the requirement that the applicant must establish um, that the application would not create an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. And that is defined as the result of, a, of the variance where the structure is larger or closer to the road or property lines than the average of the nearest 10 principal structures, or in the case of a variance request for an accessory structure, the nearest 10 accessory structures. So now that I've properly included that within four, all those voting in favor of finding that, the applicant has met element number four. All those finding that the applicant has not met element number four. Unanimous finding that the applicant has not met element number four, which um, deals with undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Number five, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. All of those finding that the applicant has established uh, that particular element, unanimous finding that the applicant has established number five. Number six, no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Uh, no other feasible alternative is defined as, <clears throat> in the case of a variance re request, there is no other place on the lot taken into consideration the physical constraints of the property or no other location on the structure that the proposed construction can go without the need for a variance or without causing the owner to create other compliance problems on the lot because of the zoning ordinance, deed restrictions, or conditions imposed by a lease or contract. All those voting in favor of finding that uh, the applicant has established there are no other feasible alternatives. 
and all those finding that the applicant has not established that particular element. Two voting that in favor and four opposed. Number seven, the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. All those voting in favor of finding that the applicant has met that standard. Opposed? I'm sorry, were you for or against? It was a late four. Four, okay. Unanimous finding that the applicant has met item number eight, or excuse me, item number seven, that it will not adversely affect the natural environment. And finally, item number eight, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas. All those voting in favor of that finding, unanimous finding that the applicant has established that the property is not located within a shoreland area. With that vote taken, could I have a motion, please? Motion to find that the applicant has not um, met the um, standards, the elements for granting of the variance. So moved. Could I have a second, please? Would you restate the motion, please? Sure. And the affirmative. As we understand the motion, there's a motion made to find that the applicant, uh, Christopher M. Supple, has um, failed to establish the elements necessary for the granting of a variance for a setback variance for the back property line for 6 Westfield Road, lot 2-9, map U42. Um, that's the motion. As a suggestion, uh, uh, remove the word failed so it will be in the affirmative. Thank the motion you. will be in the affirmative. Motion to find that um, the applicant Good question how you word that in the affirmative. I would take comments to the former chair as the best way to word that one. Uh, the way you worded it was correct. Uh, it should be in the affirmative and by na nature of the, all the elements not being passed, it did not. Uh, it, it is understood that it didn't and we are recognizing that it did not pass. Okay. And um, so basically, put it another way, we don't need technically a motion that's correct. Just a ter termination. So with that said, um, I, I, the vote has been taken. You've seen it, Mr. Seppel. They, they failed on, um, I believe it was two, if not three of the elements, Lori. Was it two or three? Two elements failed. And I think you understand the reasoning for that. And with that said, the uh, application for the variance has been denied. Three elements. Three elements. Two, yep. four, and six. Uh, two, four, and six. Yes, I do understand. I appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. And thank you for taking uh, close attention to all, all the points. And, and, you know, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, with that said, the, uh, that matter is behind us. Um, and I guess the next issue are there any communications for, to be dealt with, Mr. Smith, for the board? Um, on the communications? Yeah. Um, next month there's a, there was a conflict with the planning board in that they didn't want to, couldn't schedule a meeting during, or didn't want to schedule a meeting during vacation week, so, but the only date that they could make it work for them was the date that we meet. So I took it upon myself to agree that if we have a variance come in, that we could meet Monday night instead of Tuesday. What's the date of that? Um, it's just the Monday before the regular meeting? The day before a regular meeting, whatever okay. that is. If there's no objection to that, then we've already cross advertised that we're going to do that, but hopefully there won't be any objection. Any comment from any member? Any problem with uh, attending on that Monday instead of the Tuesday for anyone? Subject to the usual whims and vagaries of schedules. Okay, great. So noted. And that, that's the only communication I have. Um, Right. Any other news communications? Could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. I'll second that one. Second. All in favor? Thank you. So